Welcome back. So in the last intro video, we raised the question of uh, how could we possibly model how pollutants are moving across space and time and this idea of space and temporal models. Uh, and what I'm going to do now is dive into a, a very simplified version of that problem in order to give us a foundation for extending that uh, to, to greater complexity. So writing down the simplest possible model for pollution, what I'm going to do is assume uh, that we're going to work with just a single dimension right now. Uh, and so we're going to have a uh, concentration of a pollutant along some x-axis uh, at some time after its release. So we have some initial puff of a pollutant into a, you know, assuming a narrow tube of infinite length, so just a one-dimensional problem. Um, and the, the release just occurs once, it just comes, occurs instantaneously, and we ask, where does it go? You know, this is not a realistic problem, but it's, it's going to give us a foundation to move on to more realistic problems where we have multiple spatial dimensions, we have pollution that might be released uh, continuously or uh, you know, varying in time. Uh, so how might we approach this problem? Um, so one way you could think about doing this is kind of to take uh, kind of the Monte Carlo approach that we used uh, a couple of units ago and simulate this process uh, you know, through, through the, the taking of random draws, so kind of as a, ran, as a numerical simulation where we do a large ensemble prediction. So how would we model this as an ensemble? So what I'm gonna plot here um, is location on the x-axis. I'm going to assume that the release occurs at location zero, at time zero, and time's going to move upward. And I'm going to simulate uh, just one particle. And so rather than trying to predict the whole concentration, I'm just going to predict one particle. I'm going to assume that particle follows the basic concept of, of Brownian motion, which is another way of saying it's, it's going to take a random walk. Uh, so essentially, we're going to numerically set up a loop where we're just going to kind of flip a coin, go left or go right, and uh, and then we'll see where we go up. So you, you might bounce bounce right for a few time steps, turn around and bounce left for a few time steps, uh, and we'll see how, how it moves across. This one particle of, of pollutant moves across the landscape. So here we can kind of see this process of uh, just you know the wiggling of, of one little parcel one packet of, of pollutant within that tube. By itself, it really doesn't tell us a whole lot. So we can increase this to a, a small ensemble. I think this was maybe 10 particles. We're assuming that they don't necessarily directly interact with each other, but they're each you know, drifting one way or the other randomly. Um, and you can see now that they're starting uh, at one location, that, that point of release, and that they are starting as a, as a population, uh, starting to diffuse outward. Uh, so next I'm gonna increase this to a much larger ensemble size, tens of thousands of ensemble members, and simulate this process again. And now what we can see um, is while there, there's still some randomness out on the edges, a much more predictable shape to the core there. And, and like we did in the Monte Carlo analyses, we can then uh, fit a mean to that, and the mean stays approximately constant. Uh, so there's no systematic drift in one direction or the other. Uh, but we see if we put a comp interval on that, and I, I'm actually here not calculating comp interval, just calculating uh, one standard deviation. So if I look at the standard deviation there, it's, the, it's spreading out. And if I look at any particular point in time, and so this is this uh, density plot here is actually taken at the last time step. Uh, that last time step, when I could have done this at any time step, I can look at the distribution there, and it looks, you know, roughly uh, kind of like a, a normal distribution. Um, so that kind of uh, kind of normal distribution as the output kind of emerged just from this uh, process of, of numerical simulation. Uh, left and right. Um, so 
While one could approach this problem through brute force numerical simulation, and that does give us a good intuition for what, how we're kind of representing this process, it turns out for this very simplified problem, there actually is a, an analytical solution as well. Uh, and so this is the, the analytical solution for the one dimensional diffusion problem. And this uh, is predicting our response variable C, which varies as a function of X, our location on the X axis in time. Uh, and concentration is expressed in terms of mass per unit length. Um, to predict that, we need to know this capital M, the mass material in that initial release, so how much there was. Uh, we have X and T describing location in space and time. And then we have one parameter in this model, uh, D, which is a diffusion coefficient. And that's going to be a constant for any given material, but it would vary uh, across materials and across, uh, yeah, across different systems. Cool. So I'm going to take for granted that this equation exists at the moment. We'll come back later to how something like this comes into existence, that we won't necessarily fully derive it. Um, but I, instead of going into the math of this equation, I want to kind of give you a feel for what it does uh, by analogy. So to me, this equation for one dimensional diffusion uh, looks a lot like this equation over here, which describes uh, the standard Gaussian normal distribution. And in fact, if you do a bit of substitution, uh, the mean mu in the normal distribution is zero in the, um, in the diffusion equation, which corresponds to the fact that that mean stayed at where we started the release, we started at zero. And then we see that the variance sigma squared is essentially equivalent to 2dt. So if I take 2dt and substitute it into the normal, I end up with 4dt in the denominator of the exponential. And I take that and substitute it into uh, the denominator of the normalizing the square root out front. And we get a, a, a 4 pi dt because it previously was just uh, 2 pi sigma squared. So what we see is that the, the diffusion model predicts a curve that, that not just looks like a Gaussian distribution, but actually is a Gaussian distribution. Uh, and it describes this spreading process out. So, so that's, in many ways, another possible interpretation of you know, what the normal distribution is. It's also equivalent to this diffusion problem. And <clears throat> furthermore, uh, if we look at our numerical simulation, we see a few things with it. So one we, thing we saw is that if we looked across time that that mean stayed constant. It's not changing. Uh, but we see also that our, our standard deviation kind of went up. This blue line went kind of up, but it slowed down as it went. So if our, if our analytical model predicts that the variance increases as a linear function of time, so 4dt just means the variance increases as a function of time, there is no intercept, and the slope is two times d. So d essentially the fusion coefficient controls the slope and the two really just comes from the fact that there's two directions you can go in. Um, now, if that's a straight line, why is this curved over? Well, because I'm looking at the square root of the variance. So standard deviation is the square root of the variance. And so if I take a square root of this equation with respect to t, it should look like, um, should look like a square root function, which is exactly what it looks like. Um, and in fact, the, 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 the standard deviation there should be related to the diffusion coefficient. Awesome. Now, this model, this analytical solution, had a lot of assumptions that had to go into it to be able to derive an analytical solution. Um, some of the assumptions were is that there was just a single pulsed release. So we just have this instantaneous release. It, you never add the pollutant ever again. It just diffuses away. Uh, an assumption that it was conservative and non-reactive, which means that we don't the mass doesn't go away. We don't ever create more of it. We don't create less of it. That whatever is created is retained. It doesn't you know go under undergo any sort of chemical reactions with itself. Uh, with the, what it's diffusing from, with the sides of the tube, you know, it doesn't settle out. It just, it, yeah, it's conserved. 
Uh, we've assumed that the tube is completely homogeneous and the diffusivities are constant uh, and that the boundary conditions are infinite, like the tube is infinitely long. <clears throat> so really that those sets of assumptions allow us to get an analytical solution, but they end up with a problem that's not particularly useful for, for real world problems. So what I'm gonna ask next, and what we'll dive into the next unit is the question of, of how do we relax these assumptions? How do we uh, take this concept of diffusion and get to a place where we can uh, use this model in a more flexible way and, and uh, you know, uh, relax assumptions so that we can make more realistic predictions. Uh, and also kind of what's the origin of these equations? Where did that, that analytical solution come from to help us understand uh, what the actual process is? Thanks, I'll pick that up in the next video.